Hello and welcome to In the Envelope, an awards interview podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. I'm here to spotlight some of the most exciting film, television, and theater awards contenders working today. Who is in the running? What makes an awards-worthy performance? And what, dear listeners, are the secrets to giving one? We're sitting down for intimate, inspirational interviews with actors and artists to get that insider's perspective on these questions and more. It's an opportunity for some of today's most talented stars to share their craft and career advice, and maybe, just maybe, provide a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I mean, I'm always scared when I start, extremely scared. Really? Yes. Like, I, I often wonder, oh. at first. For anything? For anything. Really? Will I even be able to do it? We're back. Are we back? We're back. Is this Technically. it? Is this our our opening intro? Are we are we are we recording? Have we started? That's the question we yeah. often ask Have ourselves. We? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Hello. How are you, Jamie? I'm pretty good. How are you? How are you during the break? We had a break. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um voiceover work has been very busy, so that's kept me busy. And uh, it sounds like it. My podcast yeah. has been busy, so what about mm-hmm. you? Um plug your podcast real quick. Go. Oh, VO school. If you're into voiceover, <laughs> Uh, it's all about the art, craft, and business of that. And Indeed. we release episodes every other week. Thank you. And, it's uh, excellent. And yeah. you recently had a live show. It's a, such a legit podcast now. You do live recording. I know. Yeah, we recorded at a venue in New York at Opera America, and we had a panel, and we had a live mm. studio audience, and it was a lot of fun. And I'm trying to convince backstage people that we should do that same thing oh, yeah. for this podcast as well so if you're oh, if i you really agree do that, we should absolutely do it. it really yeah it really this does it would lend itself really well to that um yeah since we have last convened the emmy awards themselves happened yeah um and even though i've now you know i'm definitely now moving on to like it is oscar season is coming up um we have a run of episodes for you listeners uh all about both film and TV contenders, featuring film and TV contenders both, including people like today's guest, Maggie Gyllenhaal. Yes. Um, who is the star of both an amazing film role, of uh, film project and an amazing TV project. Mm. So she's actually a SAG contender in multiple categories. But um, yeah, at the Emmys, several In the Envelope guests went on to win Emmys. I know. Did you see? I did. Did you watch? Very exciting. It was really exciting. Um, I'm very happy for Ron Cephas Jones and for Darren yeah. Chris. Yeah. Um, I know that you and I are probably most excited about Tandy Newton's Of course, win. yes. <laughs> she deserves all um, the awards. Absolutely. And she was really, really surprised. It was really a, de- it was a delight to watch her win. Yeah. Um, supporting actress in a drama. Yeah, that was so awesome. Wait, you know what I'm just seeing just now? Oh, my God. I'm here at Lotus Productions, and I'm, I'm staring at this photo, and, the, and I can't quite oh. see who's in it, but now I'm... I'm realizing that it's Gina Rodriguez and Henry Winkler. Yeah. I'm, and I'm like, piece, I'm like, my subconscious just like pieced together that that's who it is. And it's in this framed photo and it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's glorious. This is meta. They're just chatting. About, They're not posing for the camera. Yeah. This is oh when um, Gina Rodriguez finished her interview and Henry Winkler showed up and there was a <laughs> wonderful little tableau that happened where they shared there's, pictures of their there's dogs. There's three of them because there's a dog. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, and uh, and that's very related to what we're talking about because Henry Winkler won an Emmy as well. Yeah, I can't believe it. I mean, I can believe it. He he deserves it. Yeah. I just love that his um in his speech he he kind of jokingly made an allusion to um the fact that he really he's never won a primetime Emmy. <laughs> I think I believe he has a daytime Emmy, but he um he gave his speech as if it was uh, him much younger. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah. He said something like you, to his kids, like, you don't have to stay up so late anymore, but his kids are grown. And <laughs> it was a, a cute acknowledgement of, of this long time coming Emmy Award for 
for his work on Barry. Yeah, yeah, it was a great that was a great little ceremony. There were some fun surprises. Yeah. And who knows what the what the coming season brings. For TV, it's never not TV awards season. Right. Yeah. And um the SAG Awards are right around the corner and people are getting their you know, their picks for who's getting nominated together soon. I've I'm already in full end of year <laughs> I'm doing a lot of like compiling the year's best performances of both stage and of both big and small screen. So that's all very much on my mind right now, and that's why it's fun to uh, try to go after certain actors for to talk on this podcast. And as per usual, there's just so many actors in the running, potentially in the running, because there's yes. so much great TV. You'd have to yes, be up 24 indeed. hours a day to, to cover everything. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, and in, in fact, I've been... Um, I haven't been great about it, to be honest. What, sleeping? <laughs> I've fallen <or>? a bit <laughs> behind. Well... I don't know if you've heard of this Food Network show, Chopped. Yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent most of my summer just watching Chopped. Oh, okay. Which is a reality cooking show that has nothing to do with my work at Backstage, but it's been very therapeutic. Okay. That was helpful for me to watch. I'm not a cook. I don't know why the show appeals to me so much, <laughs> but yeah, shout out to the many... I've infected several friends with my obsession with Chopped and... Uh, it truly has nothing to do with anything related to In the Envelope, but I'm, I'm putting it out there. I was talking to you yesterday about uh, Man in the High Castle, which is the antithesis uh-huh. of Chopped. Is that your Chopped? Yeah, uh-huh. that's my Chopped, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not escapist in any way <laughs> possible. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, and we had a really um, interesting discussion with today's guest, yeah. Maggie Gyllenhaal, um, about like escapist um, art or about how, like yes, like that kind of... Um, immersive, almost more candy kind of entertainment that's a little bit more easy to, to digest. There's still very much like a, a place for that and obviously an audience for that and all of that. And as you said, we're in this golden age of TV where there's just so much of it. But mm. um, I think in her case, and we, I knew this going into this interview, like she's interested in sort of the opposite of that, of, of stuff that kind of challenges audiences and that is a little bit more nuanced and not as black and white and a little bit more like here are the pieces of a puzzle to assemble mm. about a character or about a story. Um, the one thing I find fascinating about Maggie Gyllenhaal is that in her entire body of work, I don't think there's anything you can pinpoint and say that is something that she did that she wasn't, that she herself, based on what we know about her, wasn't connected to, that mm. wasn't like passionate about and and interested in telling like a like a a lot of her stuff is really bizarre or it's really provocative we we got into it about um how a lot of her stuff involves sex and nudity yeah um because she has a really frank perspective on that and i think she's not someone who's interested in taking the obvious gig or the obvious choice in a gig Mm. and for that reason she's she makes for an excellent guest on this show i mean any one of her roles would be fascinating to talk about um you and I were saying too, like the Dark Knight is probably her her most well known and probably her highest grossing, you know, f- yeah. film role. Yeah. Probably. But even that is, I mean, I consider that to be the greatest superhero ever made, frankly. Yeah. And super nuanced and resisting um, genre norms and resisting audience expectations and all of that, all of the good, the Maggie Gyllenhaal school of thought is is like resist. And provoke and challenge. I yeah, think. and I, I, I thought it was interesting. Every, the listeners will hear shortly that she takes mm-hmm. uh, some responsibility for newer actors now, a little bit under her wing mm. because she's been to those mm. margins and she knows the lay of the land. Yeah, she can uh, mm-hmm. maybe guide fellow actors a little bit on set. You know, totally. because she's pushed herself to those extremes. Um, Absolutely. Creatively, and she's all about pushing to the extremes. Yeah, and and it's it was cool recently to hear about like the two projects we talked about most in this interview are her TV show The Deuce, which is on HBO. Mm. Um, she and James Franco star and uh, executive produce. It was created by David Simon, um, and it's about like n- the 1970s uh, Midtown Manhattan, the rise of porn, and the the life. <laughs> Uh, prostitution. She plays a prostitute named Candy. Um, we talked a lot about that, and we talked about her Netflix film, The Kindergarten Teacher, mm. um, a fascinating film, a beautiful, strange, pff, creepy um, film about this woman who becomes too obsessed <laughs> with the talents of someone, of one of her five-year-old students. 
Um, and both of these are, are really exciting to talk about with Maggie because they both kind of provided like an insight into her acting process, but also like we got into, we were uh, able to incorporate a lot of like actorly wisdom into that. Yeah. Um, and she's also the producer on both. And so she's mm. recently stepping into the role of producer as well as actor. And she's in fact about to adapt, which includes writing, um, Elena Ferrante's novels. She's even right. talking to the novelist Elena Ferrante about doing that. So it's a very exciting time to be <laughs> Maggie Gyllenhaal, but yeah. also to be a fan of Maggie Gyllenhaal. That's right. And some good chat about the inner workings of Netflix as well, which I thought was interesting too. Yeah. In fact, yeah, <laughs> I did not expect her to yeah, be so frank about the, the numbers. I mean, she's someone who's been in indie film for a long time. And she, she said right off the bat, like Netflix has, has completely changed um, as a distributor of film, yeah. it's completely changed how people consume that and the amount of people who can consume that. That's right. Well, we should probably stop talking about it and get on with it. We should. Um, that was a great, that was a good preview of what's to come. Everyone get ready for, yes, let's do a quick intro and then let's talk to Maggie Hall. Boom. We did it. <laughs> yes. Is that our first thing? Yeah, we did it. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Backstage, the world's number one casting platform. Listen, a lot of the guests on In the Envelope, an awards podcast, used Backstage at the beginning of their careers. It's how they are now in the running for Emmy, for Oscar, for Tony, etc. If you are at the beginning of your career as an artist, here's what you do. You go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope at checkout for a free 30-day trial. That's right. Free 30-day trial if you go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope. All you got to do then is make a profile, upload a headshot, and start applying to jobs to the thousands of casting notices that are uploaded every day, which you can filter online to match your specific talents, your specific needs, your specific looks. Get that dream started today. Check out that free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe, enter the code envelope. Let's do it. Actor and activist Maggie Gyllenhaal has turned in fascinating, thought-provoking work in her many film roles, including Donnie Darko, Secretary, Sherry Baby, The Dark Knight, Mona Lisa Smile, Stranger Than Fiction, and Frank. She earned a Primetime Emmy nomination and won a Golden Globe for the miniseries The Honorable Woman, and has an Oscar nomination for her supporting role in Crazy Heart. This year, she's both producer and star of HBO's The Deuce and the Netflix film The Kindergarten Teacher. Here it is, our interview with Maggie Gyllenhaal. Um, I have so many questions. Okay, oh my gosh. <laughs> let's do it. Um, I'm so thrilled that you're doing TV and that you're doing film and that you're here to talk about both. I love what you were just saying about Netflix and how it's changing the game. I'm fascinated by the fact that you have the numbers of how many people saw The Kindergarten Teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to just ask, like, the big question of, like, where are we at in 2018 in Hollywood? What is the state of things, <laughs> um, in your opinion? It's a very interesting time. Well, in a way, I almost, it's that kind of an interesting thing to start with, and maybe we can, like, talk more specifically about things, and then we can sort of assess it at the end. Totally. I mean, you know, yeah. I think it's hard, that's a hard own. thing to answer just in a general way. Yeah. Um, I feel like something has definitely shifted, not just in Hollywood, but mm -hmm. in America. I think it has something to do with, you know, the truth being on the table uh, in mm -hmm. some cases, as opposed to wishing that the world were different than it is. Like, mm -hmm. okay, here's what's actually happening, and it's painful to deal with that, but right, it... I think is the only way that things will change. Um, but yeah, you know, obviously so many people are thinking and talking about women and the way that mm -hmm. um, that things are changing for us. And the kindergarten teacher is so much about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, maybe it's better to sort of talk more specifically and then we can come back and see. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And you've said, too, like, the, I would love to hear about, like, to the extent that you have a process, mm -hmm. an acting process, mm -hmm. but you've talked a lot about um, fantasies and how maybe particularly 
about female characters mm -hmm. of like um, the portrayal of of women is often a fantasy. It's often maybe a male fantasy. Right. And you're interested in subverting that and challenging that. Right. In everything you do. Yeah. I mean, I think people, I respond. Well, there's two different ways of making movies, writing books, you know, mm -hmm. making art. You can either make something that, right, that is a fantasy that mm -hmm. can space you out. And mm -hmm. there's there's Escapist. there's some validity to that, of course, and totally. There's times when you want totally. that, um, but but to be honest, I'm really less compelled by that. I yeah. mean, and yeah. certainly in in terms of what I want to make, I'm not as interested in that. I'm interested in putting something on the table that's that's really human. Mm -hmm. You know, because I find it comforting in my own life when I see something laid out there in a book or a movie that that not only is human that I can relate to, mm -hmm. but that maybe I haven't seen put mm -hmm. out there before. Mm -hmm. And if, and then and and often those things that aren't put out there that often are are dark. Sure. <laughs> and you're like, then you get to have this experience of like, oh whoa, that's. Me too. I feel that way. Yes. I have those like dark feelings too. Yeah. And maybe there's not something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not alone <laughs> in this. Maybe we all have these feelings. And yeah. um, I find that very comforting. I find that I mm. then feel like I'm a part of a community of people who have a big spectrum of feelings mm. and um, oh, cool, yeah, and ideas. And and I, I think that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's. I like the idea of humanity, but it's also truth, right? Like you want to portray something human and something truthful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it it plays into this, like politics have become so overtly a part of our mm -hmm. entertainment and how we talk about it. Mm -hmm. And where that intersects with Hollywood is that's what's so interesting right now. That is interesting. I mean, one thing I have, I've been feeling about the kindergarten teacher um, mm -hmm. Is like if you can like it, you cannot like it. You can agree with this, not with that. You can um, mm. relate to her or not relate to her at this point or that point. But, but I know for sure that we're offering something truthful. Mm -hmm. Like we're not messing around. Mm -hmm. We're laying out something truthful. And I think at this moment in this country where we're being lied to so much and both sides agree like oh, yeah. the right says the media is lying to you mm -hmm. and the left says the president and the government are lying to you um i think people are hungry mm. for something truthful gotcha. and not just truthful i think they're hungry for something truthful where you don't tell them this is right and this is wrong and this is mm. good and this is bad i think oh, they're yeah. hungry for something like here's the truth and it's your job to use your mind and use mm. your heart and assess it yeah. and come up with what you think yeah totally so and how much of that relates to you like how much of that like you said, you can discover things about yourself that you're like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. In my own work, for sure. I wasn't even meaning that. I When I said it, I meant like sometimes I'll watch something else and I'll be like, yeah. whoa, what did you say? That's sort of um, disturbing. And then I'm like, oh, well, well I totally, I I totally relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But I'm sure, of course, it does happen to me also inside of my own work, I guess. Sure. Yeah, for I mean, sure. I felt that with kindergarten teacher. I felt like I... That was that's such a beautiful example of the like here are all the pieces and you kind of as we're not telling you this is right and this is wrong. There's nothing black or white about yeah. that film. Yeah. And by the end, I I remember I watched the trailer for the yeah. kindergarten teacher and I was like so creepy. It's like making my spine tingle. It's very like it's like a thriller. It's yeah. She's so creepy. Yeah. Um, but watching the film, I only felt that every once in a while. It was more like I am recognizing that the actions this character is taking are really alarming and really dubious and really fraught. Mm -hmm. But I get it. I see I see where she's coming from. Right, right. And like what does it look like when somebody falls apart? Mm. I mean the yeah. movie is she's not fundamentally mentally ill. Oh no. Yeah, that's so true. But she yeah. she could have been. You could have yeah. done that kind of an interpretation on it. Yeah. I think She's somebody who is who falls apart. And, you mm. know, I have a lot of thoughts about why she falls apart, and mm -hmm. some of those are political. I mean, I think she falls apart because she's a woman in a culture that's fundamentally mm. misogynistic. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's like 
this is the cost. This could, it could be this bad. The cost of starving mm. a vibrant woman artist's mind. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be an artist, any woman, but she is an artist. Right. You know, it could be this bad. It's like a cautionary tale. Mm. But it's a little bit of a spoiler alert. But in the last scene, I was just so struck by how she she kind of gives up. Like, she kind of gives up in this way that suggests that she saw it all coming, that she kind of knew. I mean, I think in the last scene, and I, I won't spoil anything. Yeah. Um, I do think, though, sh she gets to one tiny little moment of self realization mm. she has one second where she goes oh god this is where i actually am mm -hmm. and to me to earn that one second over watching a whole 90 minutes of a movie mm. i'm way more into that yeah, than like okay. big you know transformational changes all the way sure. through like it doesn't work <laughs> like that for real right and a moment no. can be huge. And obviously, this movie's like a roller coaster. Like, a lot of intense things happen. Yeah. It's not just like a teeny, teeny, tiny, quiet movie. Like, yeah. hardcore stuff happens sure. in it. Oh, sure. But her little moment of going, oh, my God. Wow. Mm. this My feet are on the ground now. This is where I am in the planet. Mm. She couldn't have gotten there without all the rest of it. And that doesn't justify right. the rest of it. I mean, the stuff she does is not justifiable. It isn't. Right. But... It's just you can't put all of her in the bad guy box. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And it's and it's it challenge it's challenging. I think maybe that's what that that um that is what audiences want. They want to be a little challenged. They want to be not spoon fed. This is right and this is wrong. Yeah. She's crazy or she, you know. See, and that's the Netflix conversation. You know, ah, if you okay. want to have it is like, well, mm. until recently, if you lived in a little town in the middle of nowhere, how would you have had access to seeing the kindergarten teacher? You wouldn't. Maybe if you lived in New York or L.A. or sure. San Francisco, you know, you could go to your art house theater and maybe it would mm -hmm. get some play and it would expand after a few weeks and it would play for two weeks or whatever. Yeah. But I think that... I think that people want to be challenged, like you said. Mm -hmm. I think they want to use their minds. I think people are very fundamentally intelligent and emotionally mm. intelligent. And I think just feeding them stuff where they're like, okay, got it, bad guy, good guy, now I can chill. Mm -hmm. I think there's a place for that, like I said. But I think people want more than that. And to see – and Netflix basically makes a really complicated, interesting, unusual movie accessible to anybody who's interested mm -hmm. in watching it. And also, the other thing I think is the way they, I don't know much about how they do their, what's the word? I mean, how they figure out what movie is for which demographic. Right. But I think it's very respectful and sophisticated. Mm. So you might say, oh, the kindergarten teacher, who else likes art house movies that are, you know, about right. a woman or whatever. It's But that's not how they do it. Right. They really it's reach out. Yeah. You might like... I mean, I don't know. There were definitely people who who there was a big chunk of people who watched it who mostly like horror movies. Uh huh. Oh, cool. But maybe the kindergarten teacher is unusual in that. I also think, and this is another interesting thing to talk about. Like, I think it's a new kind of um, like genre. The this film. Yeah, I mean, like. I, I remember doing this interview with um, Trevor Noah, and he uh -huh. was like, I can't, qu he'd only seen the trailer, but he was like, <laughs> oh. I can't quite tell. Is it, is it a thriller? Is it a thriller? Yeah. Is it a horror movie? Is it like a, right. um, a like sort of art house movie about the intricacies of a woman's mind? Uh -huh. You know, even like, is it a comedy? When I watch oh, the movie, God. like people laugh in oh, the theater, yeah. people gasp, they like, they <laughs> giggle, they... Um, and uh, mm. and I think, and I think this has a lot to do with Sarah Colangelo, who is mm -hmm. our writer and director, who I think, I just That's think she's such... really, in, really incredible. Oh, yeah. um, I think it's, I think the movie is new because I think it's feminine. Mm, okay, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's sort of, I don't want to be... Um, I don't want to be oversimplistic about it and uh -huh. reductive about what's feminine and what's masculine, but I'm I'm really interested in yeah. like what is feminine filmmaking, and I don't think necessarily that a movie that's written by a woman or directed by a woman is 
necessarily feminine. Gotcha. Well, uh-huh. because we live in a masculine world, we're yep. told stories in a masculine way, and we've grown up that way. Mm-hmm. So to make the space for something different and yeah. new, and yeah. maybe fundamental, maybe 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 different because it's fundamentally feminine, I think is difficult. Hmm. As if it's all, as as if it's a. That's why it's hard to place it into a genre because fe- feminine is not a genre, but it's like <laughs> feminine, <laughs> right? What if that was the genre? It's funny. There's 20 <laughs> categories and one of them is feminine, feminine. <laughs> but the men get 19. Like it's, <laughs> it's terrible. That's funny. <laughs> but I think I I've I think that we as a society are are coming to grips with that with that idea that we are in a patriarchal society and right. everything we've learned right. is it's it's embedded it's boiled into right. everything we do right. Like I think. Um, I think women, uh, and probably this is true for other other groups of people who mm-hmm. have a different experience than the one that's like the sort of primary cultural experience. You know, we watch movies and we're like, um, okay, so this is told in a way that's not fundamentally the way I yeah. think. And maybe the most interesting character is a man most of the time, let's say, especially when we're kids. Mm-hmm. But we just get this muscle in us kind of exercise where we're like that's cool i can just use this little muscle flip it around and now i can relate to it (laughs) right which is a great muscle to have yeah um Hmm. but every once in a while i'll see something like i i always think about when i was like 16 or i don't know there was something like that and i saw the piano the jane campion movie Uh and i was like right Talk Whoa. about a feminine film. Why is this going in? Like, mm. in a, I don't have to use the muscle. I'm just relaxing gotcha. and it's going straight in. Yeah. Pure. Yeah. Um, not in a way that's necessarily easy to describe. No, yeah. no. And not in a way that's like a sort of fantasy version of femininity. Right. Like, right. I don't know what like it is. I don't 99% know. 99% of, of depictions of womanhood in entertainment. Right. Exactly. That's a statistic I just made up, but probably, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is also all it all of this feels re- relevant to the deuce as well. Yeah. The deuce is at this point it's meta. It's a show about <laughs> yeah, it's a sure. show about di- the disparity regarding gender in the entertainment in the entertainment biz. Right. One part of the entertainment biz. Right. Transactional sex, Transactional sex. in the entertainment industry, yes. misogyny. And also that idea of like that's funny you say the thing about them using the muscle as an audience member because that's sort of how I feel watching the deuce. Like, first of all, you really immerse watching enough of the deuce. You really kind of get into it. Mm. It's a very world building kind of a show. Mm-hmm. But I also I feel like it makes viewers more sex positive. <laughs> more sex positive. <laughs> yeah, like sure. sex is so integral to it and it's treated so casually sometimes and with so much compassion other times. Yeah, totally. And it's so part and parcel of everything that by the end of it, you're kind of like, huh, like. Yeah. Can I say that there's so much about the show that's about like the most depraved parts of human nature? Right. <laughs> right. And how it almost treats that with compassion. Absolutely. Sometimes. Like humanizes that. Yes. And a group of people who've been so marginalized and so much stigma put on them mm-hmm. and so dehumanized. Yes. Um, and that's something I'm so interested in. Why? Why all the hate for sex workers? Why? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, why? Why do we hate that with such vehemence and such intensity? Totally. Like, it's totally I don't know. Off. Yeah. I'm, I'm so curious about what that hatred is. I mean, and also dismayed, but like, yeah. why? why? No, and like I do a... think that's like one of the sort of stated goals of the show is to humanize mm-hmm. get some different muscles working like for sure yeah yeah i think it's our puritan background as americans maybe yeah but there's a lot to do with there's it. a demand there's not just supply you know uh-huh. what i'm saying so like it's very interesting <laughs> it's also a show very much about demand and supply Sure. Totally. Yes, yes, yes. There's a whole like like uh, Marxist read you could do on it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's very much a piece about I don't know how to do that, but I'm sure I'm sure somebody does. <laughs> totally. totally. It's also about the seventies, but it's about twenty eighteen, like a lot of For good sure. art these days. Right. Otherwise why make it? Yeah. Oh sure. God, that's a great I mean, not that argument. everything has to be um politicized at all, yeah. but I do think I, I do think it should feel current. It yeah. should resonate now. Yes. Well, I don't know. That's what I want to make anyway. Well, that's how I feel about I, I go to I see a lot of theater. And oh, really? often the theater, the the sadly, the one question that I find is not at, answered is the why now? Why this? Why now? Interesting. Why this audience? Why this space? Like why? It's usually Broadway. Like why is just, why Broadway? Yeah. Are you doing a revival? Why this revival? What does it say about now? Right. 
they often, I don't know, don't sure. bother asking that question. Did you see um, Oklahoma? No, the one at St. Anne's? Yeah. My office is across the street, and I haven't seen it yet. I saw the second preview. Oh, amazing. I thought oh. it was amazing. Because you live in Brooklyn. Uh, well, not because I live oh, okay. in Brooklyn, but I do <laughs> You're live a St. Anne's Brooklyn. regular? Uh, no, I, um, I actually took a... a uh, yes, yeah. I, I <laughs> someone told me it was great, and yeah, I, okay, I had, cool. a, and I wanted to go see something. And so well, I, it might go to Broadway, maybe. Be so interesting now on I Broadway, to, yeah. Um, because yeah. it's in the round. I mean, is there anywhere uh, you can do that? There's um, a Circle in the Square. I think it's the only, only one. Yeah, that's the only place I guess you could do it. It's so yeah. interesting. Yeah, cool. Um, how often do you see theater? When are you going to do Broadway again? Not often enough. Um, I don't know. I mean, the thing about doing a play Mm -hmm. is, um, if it's great, it is like literally heaven. Mm -hmm. And if it's okay, even, (laughs) and then everything worse than okay, it's so awful. It's so awful. (laughs) So awful. So painful. Okay. Um, so I just want to find... not true for film and TV? No, because you're not doing the same thing every night and you're not actively in front of hundreds and hundreds of people who Mm -hmm. are... Judging you? It's not so much judging you, mm-hmm. I think, but like their energy is coming at you mm-hmm. and it's very intense. So yeah. you have to have like a really clear artistic point of view and yeah. you have to like really be invested in fulfilling it. Yeah. Um, and for it to be good, like heaven good, the stars have to align in yeah. a way that like even if you do have all the right ingredients, it's often still doesn't. There's some. I've had it. Yeah. I would say I would <laughs> say great. three sisters uh-huh. at CSC yeah. with my husband and a l- yeah. lot of friends of mine and Austin Pendleton who's yeah. just such an incredible director and that theater um haven't been there in a long time but that theater is made for actors. Mm. Yeah. And that was heaven. I mean not everybody liked it but I did. Uh-huh. Okay. You know. Yeah. And Austin Pendleton is such a an actor's director. Yeah. It for sounds sure. like. Yeah. Yeah. Um are you going to direct? You are. Yeah. You have something announced. Something yes. that works. Yes. I'm. Um. I'm. I'm. I'm adapting um, a novel, Elena mm-hmm. Ferrante's novel, Amazing. The Lost Daughter. Into, Talk about feminine. Yeah, feminine, and also uh, the thing about Ferrante, and the reason I think why I wanted to, why I asked her for the rights to that book. Oh my god. Um, You're talking to her. No, I can't talk to her. Nobody <laughs> talks to her. But I wrote to her. I wrote Amazing. to her. Yeah, yeah, it was. I would say that was one of the things I, I mean, That's so cool. most yeah. proud of or, or was most exciting. Just yeah. even writing that letter to her. She didn't write me back, but they gave me the rights. <laughs> um, gotcha. Okay. But, um, but I heard she, she might write me back. Um, oh, my God. That's so cool. But the thing is, when I read her books, and I've read all of them, uh-huh. I really intensely have that feeling where you're like, mm. whoa, that person is so f***ed up. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, wait, I totally relate to her. <laughs> and then you have that feeling where you're like, oh, yeah. okay, it's okay. I'm not alone in having these unmentionable mm. feelings and thoughts and ideas and desires and, you know... Maybe mm. we all have them, and maybe if we can talk about them, yes, and put them out there, yes, and imagine. Uh-huh. See, this is what I think about the Ferrante, and I'm I'm so interested to see the HBO adaptation of the Neapolitan of the novels. One. Yeah, um, was that to have that experience, which I think many women had, which I, and and men too, maybe, mm-hmm. um, alone in a room, silently, quietly reading a book. Mm is a very different experience than to have it in a movie theater. Yes. So oh, I'm like, yes. I want to like, yeah. I want to see what happens in <laughs> the know, movie to, to theater. <laughs> yeah, cool, 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 cool. So. And there's the thing too, speaking of Netflix, of like certain Netflix films or even TV shows are meant to be seen on the big screen with an, with an audience around you. I saw Roma recently. I haven't seen it, but I really want <gasps> that to. That you have to see on the big screen. Right. It's like excellent sound. Right. But that would be a completely different viewing experience like in your bed, in your tiny little laptop or whatever. 
Just how I mostly watch Netflix. Right. Right. I know. Look, I understand. And I feel the same way about, in some ways, about the kindergarten teacher. There are moments mm-hmm. that are so uncomfortable in the roller coaster ride that is the kindergarten teacher where you just want to be like, I want to get off. I want to get <gasps> off. Yeah. And you're sitting and watching it in the movie theater with a bunch of people and you can't get off and you can't yeah. get out. Whereas if you're watching it at home, like, do people? Well, it's interesting. The question is, you know, do people turn it off if they get uncomfortable? And, and But Netflix mm, has the analytics on that. Right. And they basically told me they don't. Oh, my God. So, yeah. like, they can tell. But so that's, I mean, for the kindergarten teacher, it's less of a, you know, I mean, I think it's beautifully shot. And, uh, and Pepe, mm-hmm. who shot it, is an incredible DP, who also, by the way, shot the pilot of uh, The Deuce. <gasps> oh. Um, but, and I'm sure he would want huh. you to see it on a big screen. But I also, sure. I would prefer millions of people to see it than uh, very few people to see it on release. a big screen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. you know? yeah, what you were saying about how with most other uh, other indie distributors, you get to get seen in an art house theater maybe just in New York and L.A. often. Even if it's if it's a hit, uh-huh. you know, if it's like, okay, it's Little Miss Sunshine. Oh, uh-huh. Or uh, my Big Fat Creek Wedding. Or... Oh, well, maybe that one might have been different. <laughs> I know, but sure, I'm sure, sure. thinking yeah. like a... Even like say Crazy like Heart, right? Mouth. Which oh, was yeah. which was a hit. That and, came out of yeah, and and was made for very little money. I only say that one because I know about that one. <laughs> um, I love that film. Yeah, I love that film too. But uh, I, honestly, I just don't like think those numbers can <laughs> rival even what Netflix can offer. Yeah, and it's and incredible. honestly, like not only that, it's not just that I want people to see my movies, which of course I do. Mm-hmm. But I want many different kinds of people from many different places okay. to see my movies, gotcha. yeah. which di- with from different, you know, d- different experiences and ideas. And maybe they thought they thought this, but then mm-hmm. they shift a little mm-hmm. or I mean, that's what I wish for. Mm-hmm. And then the algorithm. I'm so down with Netflix right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, (laughs) we we all are like slaves to it, but like happily, they're... they're... No, you're not a slave. You get to choose (laughs) what you want to watch and you you also... Yeah, I don't know. I, I... why are you a slave, right? You get, you get to you get to choose. I get to choose. I mean, there's something about it's like a library. It is like a library, and I, and the way the way that a library should work is that you should read something that you like, and then get recommended something else that you would then like. And sometimes that right. um, algorithm that's targeted at you can feel invasive. They don't oh, actually have like an invasive. I never, I never listened to that. I don't what even do you know. You know what it is? I know what it is. I never listen to what they recommend for me because oh, because it's okay. so off because so my children watch so many oh, movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. they're like, we think you might like, you know, like twinkle toes <laughs> of the whatever. I'm gotcha. Like, so it doesn't the work. The algorithm doesn't work. Because uh-uh. right, right, right. okay. they all do it on my account. I see. So are, when you go to Netflix, do you do you seek out you seek out stuff? It's stuff I know yeah. I want to see. That you want to see. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Do you watch a ton of TV? No, film? I watch almost nothing. Oh, I've been, I've interesting. No time, I know. I know. <laughs> but you know what I loved I that I saw time. recently? Uh, I just watched all of Fleabag. Uh huh. I loved it. That is a great show. A great show. That was a great. It's six half hour episodes. Also. Exactly. So you can handle it. it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that it stuck in my mind. I saw it a year a year ago. Or whatever, I just finished it a couple weeks ago. Oh my god! And Olivia Coleman mm-hmm. was so sensational. Yeah, oh. I haven't seen The Favorite yet. Uh-huh. Have yeah, you? Get ready. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. so amazing. No, I haven't seen it. Talk about, like, feeling uncomfortable as an audience member oh. and challenging, like, how we think of femininity. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're making me want to see Maggie it. Maggie Gyllenhaal would love The Favorite now that I think about it. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, the Okay, but for Candy, too, in The Deuce, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's the other meta element, is that she's discovering that she's a director. Sure. And I heard that you actually, that the character was supposed to be just a producer of porn? I mean, so I had the first three episodes when I signed on to do it. And the way it was pitched to me was that really she was like a money-minded, like a businesswoman. And that is how it's set up in the beginning. You know, no pimp. I keep my money. Mm -hmm. Nobody makes money off my pussy but me. You know, Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And, um, And then the second episode of the first season, she goes and makes her first porn movie. And I felt really strongly that that scene 
like you say, it's all very sex positive. Like she, the sex mm. to her is incidental. She's like, okay, yes. well, I do this every day. I, this this is not what's interesting here. What's interesting here is like, like, oh my god, whoa, <laughs> we're all made of light, Ooh. and like, what happens if you? I see that the little thing is a camera, uh-huh. and then if you like, whoa, what if the frame is looking at just his face uh-huh. as opposed to like the whole room? Oh my God, whoa! <laughs> you know, and I think whoa. she has a kind of like a, a like almost like a birth of an artist kind yeah. of moment. And after that scene, I just was pushing on them, pushing on them. I think she's a director, okay. and the most exciting thing about working, I would say, the most exciting thing about working on long form television that is being written as you're working on it yes. is the impact not just as a producer reading the drafts having conversations but the way i play scenes affects what happens the following happens episode later. Ugh, that's so cool so yes. cool so and cool that, i feel like that backstage listeners of this podcast that's what they want to hear that the actor especially on a tv show yeah has power in a way yeah because you you made that decision about her being a director because you were in character is yeah. that correct yeah well, not only in character, but a thinking actor who made a decision mm-hmm. about how, what's the most interesting way to play the scene gotcha. and, you yeah. know, what is going to be my take on the scene. Oh, you know yeah. what? I think this is the birth of an artist. I mean, what a cool th- scene to play, you totally. know? Then all of a sudden a scene where actually I speak very little and, you know, it was kind of funny. It was like that Campbell soup, potato soup scene. Uh-huh. I don't know if you remember that, you know, becomes a combination of all of those things, which mm-hmm. are great and something kind of really big. Oh yeah. So yes, I think I I did play a part in her becoming a director. Hmm. And then yes, I think playing a director all day, imagining that combined with a real shift I think where we are culturally in mm. my business and also in America mm-hmm. made me realize that I think and I'm not proud of this but I think there was a part of me that didn't feel entitled to direct. Uh huh. You know, I've always been like mm. um, a storyteller. I've always been interested in the piece as a whole. And obviously there's so many, so much I don't know. I mean, I'm going mm-hmm. into this very um, aware of that, you know, and curious and interested in how I learn. And, you know, but I do mm-hmm. think like I am... I am always interested in what the piece is saying as a whole and how to say it. And mm-hmm. and I think, I don't think you have to be as an actor. Right. Although I think... In touch with that. No, right. I think, I think mm. the best actors usually are gotcha. interested mm-hmm. in that. But that's not even true. I bet there's some phenomenal actors that are like, I'm going to do my thing. You do yours. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to do that. So it's hard for me to imagine. Interesting. Even coming from a family of filmmakers, like, did it ever, has it has it only been a recent thing of the, because you became a producer for these two projects mm-hmm. more recently, mm-hmm. and now this new directing role, which is so exciting. Well, what I'm saying is I think, I think somewhere I didn't feel entitled to do it, mm-hmm. even though I always had a pull toward storytelling and toward the, what the piece is saying as a whole. Mm-hmm. And I think when you... For example, when you're in every single frame of a movie, Mm. how you decide to play scenes will deeply influence Mm. what the movie ultimately says. I mean, what if I'd played Lisa like she was mentally ill? Right. Or, Mm. I mean, whatever, any number of things, little shifts and changes that, I mean, if if you're choosing projects like I, I am, I think mostly when I'm lucky, that require you to walk on a tightrope. If you fall off that tightrope mm-hmm. on one side or the other, the movie doesn't say what you want it to say. Like, for example, you don't want you want Secretary to be a love story mm-hmm. about two mm-hmm. people who love in a way that is different than mm-hmm. what's supposedly culturally yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Um, you don't want it to be um, a story like that where she doesn't have consent or like whatever about, sure. about abuse or, you know, so it's mm. a super fine line yeah. you have to walk in order to tell that story. I'm interested in telling stories like that. Gotcha. Yeah. And if you're, if you're interested in telling stories like that, how you play each scene could tip you over one way or the other on Gosh, that yeah. on that tightrope. And those are directorial ideas. Uh-huh. Those is, that's directorial thinking. But I think it's only wow. recently that I thought, I'd like to try to do this. Yeah. And, um, and it's totally yes, yes, without a doubt. And it's so interesting to think this inspired and influenced by Candy. 
for sure. It totally is. Yeah, she it totally is. is. The, she's the moment. She's the 2018 women in Hollywood. She's yeah. every 2018 woman in Hollywood. Because you, you saying the, like, I never felt entitled, I think a lot of women in Hollywood have said that. Yeah, but Candy is, like, so outside of all that that she's just like, wait, wh- why? Uh, okay, I think I'm just going to take the camera now because I get it. I see it. I, like, see yeah. where this camera needs to Do you mind if I just move and it? And her cameramen are stupid. And it's like, yeah. Um, She's everyone so beneath her. <laughs> no, 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 and especially not Harvey. Even though Harvey oh, yeah. and she fight all through season yeah. two, they but it's a love fascinating each relationship. other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love David Crumhold so much, who plays Harvey. I really love um, Dominique Fishback. Yeah, she's what's not to totally love? Stunning. Yeah, yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah, and also um, Emily Mead this season, mm-hmm. particularly, she's oh, yeah. really great. Little Red, Little Red, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess there's a couple more episodes to go before. Are you, is season three happening? Yeah. Soon? Uh, soon? No. Yeah, we'll probably start February. Okay, cool. Yeah, soon. Do you have, you? but for now you're, um, is it safe to say you're in like campaign? Should we call it a campaign? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a lot of press for the kindergarten teacher. We're like the uh-huh. grassroots. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, that and I'm uh, I'm finishing my adaptation of The Last Daughter. Oh, I'm real which close. Is all, which also involves writing. Yes, I'm doing the adaptation, yeah, which has been, um, honestly, I mean, it's very hard work, Mm -hmm. but, and I've never written a screenplay, although uh, I am somebody who, I don't, I've realized this recently about myself, I understand things, I sort things out Mm -hmm. by writing them down. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I've been asked to write a speech, you know, for Planned Parenthood or for this or yes. for that. And I'll use it as an opportunity to kind of sort out where I'm at in the world right now mm-hmm. in relationship to something else. And um, and so I've been, you know, we've been taking the kindergarten teacher to every single thing film festival Mm -hmm. that will have us and we'll like (laughs) you know been like running around we're like we're like you know um we're all over the place these days and 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 in the mean like in the plane rides and in the taxi rides from hotel to hotel um in the shower you know after i drop my kids off at school i'm i'm writing or i'm writing in my head yeah and it's um it's been so grounding mm. to just have like a little space that's mine. Yeah, and a project that's consuming you. That's, that's yeah, asking a lot of you. Yes, and to be able to also like be in this pretend conversation with Elena Ferrante, uh, you know, because this ghostly figure, because it's her book. Yeah, and 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 I trust her book. Mm. I'm like bouncing all my ideas off the book, and cool. they keep coming back with more and more. <gasps> Yeah, it's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. I love, um, obviously we ask a ton of acting advice on this podcast, but I love the writing advice. I love the like insights into how people write, how they sort out their thoughts on paper. Yeah. And I love the idea of you having a conversation with the source material. Well, and also, and also as an actress, it's so interesting because mm. my mom is a screenwriter and mm-hmm. I haven't shown anybody any of it, but I was talking to her a little bit about it. And my mom was like, well, you might want to have someone read it. And I was like... No, I don't need that. Yeah, I no. know I don't need that because I I imagine I play through the scenes as everybody. Okay. Like I get them down. Because you're used to doing that. Because I'm used to doing yeah. that. And I, I have I have a facility with that. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, oh, no, we can cut all of that. Nobody needs that. Gotcha. And uh, of course a good actor can get from here and leap over to here. Without, yeah, yeah, yeah. Without gotcha. these four lines that I stupidly wrote down. <laughs> you know I, mean? <laughs> I see. Because that, so that's an, it's a trick of writing to be, to immerse yourself in the acting role and do that thing of like, the big picture, that that instinct of the big, uh, almost like bird's eye view of the storytelling, of the story. Right. Well, right. That is, so I find with acting too, I find I'm using a really similar muscle. Hmm. I find as I've gotten older, as I've gotten stronger and learned more about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yes, sometimes I just do the basic building block stuff of like, what's the event in the scene? What's the, what are are the needs and what are the obstacles? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like actor studio thing that I was taught. Mm -hmm. I do do that. I do find that helpful, especially the event because The the event is the directorial element. The event is how am I, what do I think this scene is about? 
There might be these lines, but I think it's an apology. That's where it fits cool. into the big picture of the story. Mm-hmm. But wait, I got off track. I was going to say <laughs> the most interesting work that I do as an actress, like like prep work, yeah, is somehow just like kind of getting my mind in the territory of the piece mm-hmm. and then just opening And I don't know exactly how to explain how to do this. And I don't know how to do it always. But like opening my mind, maybe my unconscious, to Mm. whatever's going to come up. Mm -hmm. And I find usually it's pretty cool. You're like, Mm. oh, I for some reason feel like... I don't know what would be a good example of that. Uh, right. I don't know something. I feel I've. Or this is interesting me, or or that's yeah. interesting me, and just letting that all come up. Right. And then usually it organizes itself into a larger meaning, and I find it's the same uh-huh. with writing. Oh my god! Like I know basically what the themes are. I have the the format of the mm. book. I'm I'm. I'm really interested in these characters. Mm-hmm. I'm writing their interactions. And then all of a sudden I'll be like, wow, I can't uh, believe that 40 pages earlier uh-huh. I had this thing happen because look how it's paying off here and look what it means. And I didn't even know it. Right, 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 right. But I find that that muscle comes mm-hmm. from practicing acting. Sure. Yeah. And practicing, I love the image of you on the tightrope because I feel like that describes your acting specifically. Of the, like, yeah. falling one way or the other. Yeah. And I want it to be hard. Yes. And I also you never... Want to be I never want... And this is the same in my writing, too. Yeah. I never, ever want to just only be meaning what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Like I said, cool. like, I want these to be the lines, but really I'm apologizing. Yeah. Ugh. I want, you know... Totally. These to be the lines, but really, I'm 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 asking you out, uh huh, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. With the event, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, the event is a proposal. The event is mm. an apology. And the same with my writing. I don't I don't want to give. A, I want a great actress to come to my movie. You know, <laughs> and I and that's another thing. I think how amazing it would be to ask an actress, mm. knowing what it feels like. Like I will never. I would. Um, how do I put this? I. I don't want to be told what to do or how to play something. Mm -hmm. I want someone to want me to come in and put myself into it. And and I want to only choose things where there's space to put myself into it. Mm -hmm. So I want to, like, find an actress. And I I have a few in mind Uh, who I just have so much admiration and respect Mm -hmm. for and say what would you do with this? Yeah, to ask them. Yeah, where where would you fall on the tightrope? Or what, what's the tightrope? Like, or go, like, I want to watch you. Yeah, or and what do you find interesting in your subconscious? Yes. And how do you read this? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And to try to make the space mm-hmm. for somebody who works like that oh, yeah. to put themselves into it. Sure. Yeah. But you said you haven't you haven't shared it. You have so many, you have access to so many amazing filmmakers in your life. Yeah. Are you going to, are you asking anyone for advice? Or are you bringing anyone in? Or Yes, I will. I mean, I haven't finished the adaptation, although I am very close. And once I finish it and go over it and really feel like I've gotten it into the best shape that I can get it into by myself at this moment, there are a few mm-hmm. people I really admire and who I've worked with or not worked with or know, or whatever, who I who I will share it with mm-hmm. and take their notes very seriously. Including your, like, how does it work with your yes, mom? Yes, I, I will. I will share it with my mother. Probably I'll start with my mother and my husband. Uh-huh. Uh, my husband, I think, is just such an incredible actor. Sure. And such a, such a fascinating artistic mind. Oh, I bet. Um, and actually, I showed him one scene <laughs> that he read with me, a long, complicated scene. And hmm. he was like, why do you have that line at the end? And I was like, well, because this happens and this happens and you don't know the book and da-da-da. And he was like, if I were acting it, I would I would try to get you to cut that. 
Okay, see, that's so cool. <laughs> so cool, right? That's what you mean about the uh, like using an actor that you trust. Exactly. Whose tastes But trust. I would say, I said to him, I was like, and if I were directing you... <laughs> You'd fight for it? I would hear that uh-huh. and see if I could challenge you to say it anyway. Okay. You know, like, if, as long as sure. you're not like, you're wrong. I mean, I sure. do not think my husband is going to be like wrong as an actor ever. Why would you be wrong? No, right, you right, know? Right, right. Like, right, What does cool. that even mean? What does that mean? Exactly. There's but no... like, oh, I hear you. I get it. I get it. Have all that there. Right. See if you can also say it. Then let's see what happens. Yeah. Because yeah. so, then you never know. Like if the, a director pushes an actor in that in that direction, the actor goes, oh, and then they have some completely maybe, new reading. Yeah, maybe. Totally. You know, who knows? And that's when you know a collaboration is really working when people yeah. are like, yeah. it's a tennis match. Yeah. yeah and like, yeah, cool. it, but it takes mutual respect. I mean, that's ideal. Mm-hmm. And you don't always have that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and I am fascinated by how you choose your projects in general. I imagine that there's often times when you're, when you read scripts and you're like, no. Yeah. 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 (laughs) No, like, what are those? What are those roles? And what is it, what is it about, like, is a huge part of the decision of whether to take on a role or audition for a role, I suppose. Is is it the collaborators? Is it like, oh, I really want to work with that person or... Uh, I think it really depends. I think that sometimes it is in the script and you're like, like with the kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. I read the script for the kindergarten teacher and I was like, oh my God. Like some visceral, Mm -hmm. really intuitive part of me was like, yes. And then an intellectual part of me was like, this is incredibly well written. This is beautifully structured. And, the, the, you know, so like those, the combination of this kind of visceral pull, mm. meaning I think what the visceral pull is, it's offering me the opportunity to explore something that's on the edge of my mind, of what I know about my mind. Ooh. And that's very Not hard at the to center. No, like, oh, whoa, yeah, yeah. what's over there? Mm. Um, there's a, it's like a combination of that and like just fab, really excellently written. Right. The um, brain is recognizing, oh, this is just well structured. Beautifully well, yeah, well, yeah. well written. Gotcha. And then there's things like the deuce. Like that's going to mm-hmm. ultimately be what, like 24, 25 hours mm-hmm. of television. And I'd read three. Mm-hmm. And also Tricky. Candy had like nothing to do in the first three episodes. Very little. <laughs> but I was like, yeah, I wanted to work with David Simon. Mm-hmm. I was really compelled by the idea of the character. Sure. And I got a little spark like, oh, that could be cool. And you hadn't done a regular TV role. I did The Honorable Woman. Yeah. But that was right. Miniseries, yeah. London. Which is so, right. Kind of Which different. is sort of more like a movie than an, than an ongoing. Well, right? it was all written Yeah. before I started. So, yeah, I didn't know what I was jumping into. It just into. feels like more of a leap to re- to sign on to something that doesn't have three seasons of TV written. No, already. for it sure. It just gets written and written and written. I didn't know how yeah. to sign on to that. Mm. I didn't That's know cool. how what to, but I wanted to. Does that speak to a bigger trend, too, of like, there are a lot of movie stars who are on TV. Mm-hmm. Is that trend just because of there is more of the those projects that are going to TV that that have that visceral pull? It sounds like. Yes, I think it's been really hard to make good movies. Mm-hmm. You know, to get them financed, to yeah. get them going, and to get them seen. Mm-hmm. And so, television yeah. somehow became the place where all the interesting artists were going. Sure, and so. I don't know. I guess I think for me, after I did The Honorable Woman and it felt so great. So well, that was an amazing experience. Um, mm. I just was like, well, it doesn't matter if it's on TV or yeah, if yeah, it's, yeah. it's just I just. Cool. But that, that's not really right either, because it's very different working on TV. And I found coming back to playing Candy after, after having finished playing her, you know, uh, I was like, what is this? That is new, yeah. Totally strange. And hmm. and it felt a little disorienting. And I was like, I mean, I'm always scared when I start. Extremely scared. Really? Yes. Like, I, I often wonder, uh, at first. For anything? For anything. Really? Will I even be able to do it? Like, let alone do it well. Wow. What's the fear? Where does that come from? You know, I really would like to be able to put that down because the truth is, I'm like, will I be able to do it? I've done it so many times. Sure, sure. What do you mean? Of course I can do Mm. it. I wonder if it has something to do with a kind of... Oh, I don't know. (laughs) I think maybe it has something to do with exploring the things that are on the edge of what I know, you know, so that I'm like, I'm in dangerous territory, Mm -hmm. territory that 
means I have to grow in order to do mm-hmm. it well. If you show up to set one day and you're totally comfortable, it means that you're not on that edge. Well, it also, once I get going and I'm in the groove and totally. stuff, I don't always like feel terrified. terrified. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like to feel, yeah, like I'm really on the tightrope, even hmm. once I'm in the groove. Uh, hmm. Wait, why are we talking? Oh, because it was so weird coming back to play candy. Because, yes, I felt, mm-hmm. I felt that terror, sort of. But I was also like, I, I kind of, ha- I kind of like know who she is. You know, I like show right. up on the first day yeah. back, and I'm like, uh, I had just had the flu. I had the flu really bad last oh. winter, like 104 fever, Ooh. and yeah. So I was kind of like still drinking Whoa. chicken soup and uh-huh. stuff when I started the second season. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sick. Am I going to be able to do it? And I just step in. I'm like, oh, yeah, candy. I candy. totally got this. Like you know. And you like candy. Oh, I love candy. Yeah, yeah. I love candy. That's important. Yeah. 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 You want to be challenged and you want to play people that you you like getting to know or getting to be. Yes. I mean, it's like, well, I mean, I like Lisa, too, from mm-hmm. the kindergarten teacher, but yeah, she's so confused. You know, she's so deeply she's so confused sad. that it was not a pleasure to be her. Sure. Whereas Candy, even though she goes through some horrible things, I mean, mm-hmm. especially in season one, you know, she gets mm-hmm. beat up and, you know, she's always getting told no and she's always sure. being asked to compromise. And But she thinks so clearly mm-hmm. no matter what. And she doesn't have the luxury to feel bad for herself. Gotcha. Or yeah. stop. Right. I mean, what is Candy going to do if she mm. stops? Right. She's like all in. Yeah. You cool. know? Yeah. So I like, it's such a pleasure to be in such a clear mind. My mm. mind, like most people's, it's not like is that. probably like a combination of sometimes <laughs> clear, sometimes confused, yes. you know? I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's such a wonderful, I really didn't think... I had this like idea of what I consider your style to be, and what you've said is is close to that. It's said much more vividly than I would have described it. But like, I'm curious what you think. I my feel style like is. well before this, like I I would have said that you choose roles that are challenging and that are that are as far outside of you. And you you have said about the like about the breaking the fantasy thing of like you don't want to play maybe a male fantasy of a woman or a right. Um, and so that like intentionally um <laughs> intentionally challenging those norms but also i think provoking like right. you're provocative right and a lot of your work involves nudity and sex which i actually should probably also ask about cuz like yeah. in terms of advice for actors mm-hmm. you the deuce net has a, um an intimacy coordinator yeah was the first to do so now i think H- every hbo show does yeah yeah and but sure you that. are no stranger you are a, somewhat of an expert in terms of nude scenes and sex scenes mm-hmm. And that so that's characteristic of your work, too. And that says mm-hmm. <laughs> something about. Well, if sex is a, if you're interested in breaking down a fantasy, sex is mm. really um, like it's uh, you can really do that with a sex scene because it, we're, we're fed so much fantasy mm-hmm. in terms of like mm-hmm. what sex is supposed to look like. That's so funny because Candy's like they're staging what, what sex is supposed to look like without. <laughs> right. Well. Although and in the earliest porn too, there weren't examples of what she was doing. She was just well in 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 Red Hot in her movie. Mm-hmm. I think she's trying to subvert that a little. The yes, fantasy, totally, just like I am, just like you are. I was <laughs> yeah. gonna say, yeah, yes, but exactly. But I also think so. So sex scenes are interesting because you're like, oh, I know you've seen a lot of scenes that look like this. You've seen a lot of orgasms that look like this. You've mm-hmm. seen a lot of well, but is this really what sex looks like in your life? Is this really the form it takes in your mm-hmm. life? You know, mm-hmm. and so that can be an interesting way of breaking that down. I also find, I think I found when I was younger. Mm-hmm that other people are interested in sex. We are all interested in sex. Mm -hmm. And it can be a kind of a hook. Okay, Mm. now you interested? Now let's talk about what's really on my mind. (laughs) Totally. What's really on my (laughs) mind is this, but I got you in the door. And that's that's a little bit sad, Uh, you know? But I also like, but I mean, I think when I look back on it, that's probably true. You and can, I also like I'm also interested in nudity. I think I think bodies are so interesting mm-hmm. and I think especially bodies that look real. Right. You know, and look different and yeah. um 
and uh, and aren't like lit perfectly fantasy. to look yeah. like. I love that, and I think yeah. everyone's comforted by that too. Yeah, I think that's I think that's becoming increasingly true. I hope. Yeah. 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 So, what advice do you have for actors who? Maybe they're debating doing a nude scene or they're they're thinking about it. Like, what are the basics of how do you protect yourself, first of all, and, like, right. really make sure that you're in a safe space and that you're comfortable? Right. Well, it's a kind of a great time now mm-hmm. because everybody is so focused yeah. on making sure that actors are comfortable and that their yeah. boundaries aren't crossed. I think that's – I really do believe that's true. I that's mean, good. at least in HBO. Mm-hmm. Um but I think that's that's really something that has like a bright light shining on it, which I think is amazing. Um, I think, you know, I would not do a nude scene that wasn't in service of something that I thought right. was cool, mm-hmm. interesting. Like, yeah. like I like, is it honestly serving the story? Yeah, and then and I'm thinking not, about some of the lovely actors who've come onto our set and just taken their clothes off and just been like okay where do you want me to be <laughs> cool. and um and i do think it's cool um uh and i think it's hard i mean it's hard to i'm thinking about the girl this one girl who i did a scene with i we both were naked and yet mm-hmm. i got to go on and tell the rest of my story and she didn't get to because she was just in that one scene right i don't know if i would have done that scene and yet Gotcha. I totally get why she did. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. You gotta you gotta ask yourself. I think you have to ask yourself if yeah. it feels right. Yeah. And also you can tell if right, if it's in service of a fantasy and you're not that interested in feel, that fantasy, right, right. then don't do it, you know? Yeah. And I also think like lay the boundaries out as clearly as you can before you start. I remember Jeff Bridge is actually really doing that. Where so where can I touch you? Oh. What feels comfortable to you? What are the boundaries? And then mm. for me, you have once a frank those, discussion. Once those boundaries are laid out, which the intimacy expert can help with, yeah. um, then just be free. Then act the yeah. scene. Gotcha. Don't stop acting when you're doing this the nude scene. I would hope not. You right. know, but that happens a lot. Because if that's getting in the way, right, 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 right. Um, Do everything you can in order to just put yourself in the in the world and in the character so that you can continue to... Yeah. Like, in The Kindergarten Teacher, there's a little bit of nudity. I mean, I know we're basically talking about The Deuce because season one, there was just so much nudity. Sure. And we, we can talk about it more. But I was thinking, like, this other version where uh, there's a scene where I, like, come home from a late night. I'm wearing this tight dress and I'm just like a woman in Staten Island. I take my dress mm-hmm. off and get in bed with my husband. Mm-hmm. And I just took the dress off. I took the bra off. There's some nudity in it and I get in bed. Right. But it felt very real. Right. That woman would never, like, hide her breasts right. to get into bed totally. with her husband. And what this woman's body looks like and her, what her breasts look like yeah. and and how she gets into bed with her husband tells you so much about her. So mm. for me, I don't mind that. Mm-hmm. But for lots of people, they do. And I have so much respect for that. Sure. And then you can say, like, but if you shoot it that way, you're going to see my breasts. And I'd rather you didn't. It's hard sure. to do. So hard to do. That's why I've been doing this so long. Like you say, I've done so many so many Provocative. nude scenes that sure. I I know how to assess what makes me comfortable and not comfortable, and mm. I know how to say it. But mm. that's why, uh, the reason why an intimacy coordinator is not there for me. She is gotcha. there for the person who's coming in and is a jobbing the... actor yeah. and has one day on the show and is so psyched to be there and doesn't want to upset anybody mm-hmm. and is a... F- really is afraid to say so understandably afraid to say yeah. no but right. she's there mm. to call them the night before and say hey really for real you can say no mm-hmm. like for real yeah. i know it says you do this and this and this you actually don't have to gotcha. yeah. and this is what it says you're going to do in your contract you actually don't have to okay and you just have to tell me mm. would it be better for you if i gave you my number and you kept your phone in your pocket and you texted me uh-huh. would it be better cool. for you if you just sort of said like I don't know, like uncle, you know, whatever. Sure. Um, I, I don't know because I. You've had a lot of practice. I don't. I don't need that anymore. Yeah. But I mean, I'm a. I've been doing it a long time, you know. <laughs> and I, I really do see actresses and actors all the time need that help, and I think it's yeah. amazing that she's there. Yeah, that's so awesome. I think. I mean, every show should have it, obviously. And it used to be other actors that did it for each other. I mean, I've many oh. times been like, you know, are you okay? Do you need something? Why is nobody wow. coming over with your robe? You know, and other people have done it for me. And that's, I mean, that's cool too, but 
it's like that's exactly why you need the official person. Exactly, because what if the other actor doesn't isn't care about how you that, feel? Yeah. Or <laughs> <Right>. yeah, <laughs> like you said, you certain collaborators are not necessarily the most respectful, respectful or receptive, or yeah, that's right. Yeah. Or perceptive of other That's people. right. That's right. So to have her there, I think, is incredible. Also, it takes the pressure off the other actors having to take care of each other. Mm. I mean, of course, we take care of each other anyway. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's nice to have someone doing that job that you trust. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, it really is all about, like, setting up a, the environment of being... You need to set up a safe and comfortable environment so that in your job as an actor, you can go to those uncomfortable, not safe the edge that you're exactly, talking about. Exactly, exactly. And if the actual atmosphere is not that, you're going to have a tough time with the internal stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. 100% yes. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is, I think yeah. you have to go. Okay, this great. is awesome. Um, everyone go see Kindergarten Teacher because it's right there on your Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> In the Envelope, an awards podcast, is recorded at Lotus Productions, Hyperbolic Audio, and Big Yellow Duck in New York City, and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Like, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, and follow us on Twitter at In the Envelope. Thanks, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast extraordinaire Jamie Muffet, and thank you to the team at Backstage the most trusted name in casting. That's Peter Rapoport, Rowan al Khatib, Francis Ramos, Caitlin Watkins, Lauren Rout, Mark Stinson, and especially Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. Backstage.